Hello, BookTube. I just recently saw a video on Jonathan Cohen's channel uh, that I wanted to amplify and put it before you and discuss all sorts of things. Not only because I'm really hoping that you will go over and subscribe to his channel. He's within breathing distance of 3,000 subscribers. How much fun would it be to get him over that, that, that threshold? That's a wonderful threshold to get over. But also because it touches on a large chunk of my own life. And I would imagine, if you're an American, uh, almost inevitably a chunk of your own bookish life. Because it involves the, the bookstore super chain, Barnes & Noble. The only big chain left in the country. Um, I'll leave a link to Jonathan's video. You really should watch that in tandem with this one. He's he's a, a compatriot, a true believer. His channel's wonderful anyway, because he does terrific informed book reviews. He's passionate about his niche subjects. Uh, and he talks directly to you. There's no none of the, the fake Android stuff that you might encounter in other channels. So well worth your time to add it to your roster of booktube videos. But uh, as he mentions in his video, Barnes & Noble, has added a new membership program for their customers. Premium membership, Barnes & Noble Premium. Those of you who've been Barnes & Noble customers for years will remember the, the ordinary Barnes & Noble membership, which does still apply. It does still exist. $25 gets you a plastic card for the old membership. You, get, you pay $25, you get a plastic card, you get 10% uh, off almost everything in the store, you get tons and tons of member only sale coupons uh, that sort of thing uh and i be, was infinite intimately familiar with the barnes and noble membership card because i worked at barnes and noble for 25 years i was there when they introduced the program and i was there as it grew steadily and steadily into more of a cudgel that middle management could use to browbeat employees it gradually grew to being the only yardstick the only metric of your existence at Barnes & Noble. You're late all the time. I don't really care. You're rude to the customers. I, I don't really care. You, you make drinks that have arsenic in them. I don't really care. What we're really going to care about, the only thing we're really going to care about is, do you sell memberships? At the register, you had to do a, a canned cold sales pitch to every single customer. You had to mention it to customers on the sales floor if they flagged you down and said, I'm looking for Ruth Rendell mystery novels. You had to say, oh, they're right over here. And oh, by the way, uh, I th for my store anyway, here in Boston, before it closed, uh, those strictures were more honored in the breach. Uh, certainly, I ignored them completely. If, if a customer came up to me and merely wanted to buy a magazine, my instincts, I would tell me whether or not I want, was going to bring up the membership program with them at all whether I was going to mention it at all. Uh, because there's nothing worse, right? As I'm sure you know, I'm, uh, they've become it's become so ubiquitous now for big companies to ask you to pay for good customer service that you almost can't avoid it when you're at a register anywhere. And I'm sure that you have had the sinking feeling the same as I have. When you go to the register of a big Barnes & Noble and the, the sales clerk starts in on the spiel, and you know, you're not going to blame them, you know that management is expecting that they will not take no for an answer. I was told that, and I heard other employees told that. In the course of the time when we were selling memberships at the registers, managers, the shame, the more shameless among them, would sometimes say, when you mention it, if the customer says no, push it a little further. And I lost track of how many of those managers. I said, okay, badgering the customer is bad customer service. You do that too too many times, and for me that would be one time. If you do that too many times, that customer is going to go somewhere else, because if they know for sure that they're going to get badgered at the registers, they're going to avoid Barnes and Noble. Do you want that? And I don't want I don't want this video to degenerate into war stories, into horror stories from Barnes and Noble. But I wonder how many of you would be surprised at how many of those middle managers didn't seem to really care whether or not the customer is alienated from ever coming back if you get a membership out of it. Uh, but that was the deal that we offered to customers. And I'm not saying that I never brought it up. I did. If, if I knew that a customer was in the store regularly, I would often say, you know, you should seriously consider this because, yes, it's anathema to be asked to pay for a loyalty program. 
that is anathema. The whole point is that you're ensuring loyalty by giving great customer service. I don't think it's any surprise that the general across the board level of customer service at stores like Barnes and Noble took a nosedive the minute the company started simply making you pay for it. <laughs> if you can, if you, if you can guarantee a level of customer service based on what you pay, then the employees don't have to be nice <laughs> to, to most customers. Uh, but even so, if a customer would come in regularly, then I would make sure to, to have that conversation with them. I would make sure to say, look, you're in here a lot. And yes, you have to pay $25 up front. Yes, in order to get this little laminated card, you would be adding $25 to your purchase today. And yes, there is an element of that that is counterintuitive. But if you think about the long game, this is getting you 10% off almost everything. For, for instance, I would look at what they had in front of me at my register and say, this is getting you 10% off almost everything here. This one purchase would be saving $6. How many times a month do you do this? Right? No sales. For me, there was no canned sales pitch, no Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross thing at all. It would just be, does this make sense for you? If you're going to keep coming here, and I hope you do because I love seeing you, this is going to save you money in the long run. Sometimes there were sales that were self-evident. You know, a, a big spending customer coming in from overseas who was only going to shop this one time at my Barnes & Noble. They're in America for a conference or something or other. They're buying a lot of stuff. Of course, the, the card costs $25 and gets you a 10% discount off almost anything that you would bring to the register, which means if your purchase is over $250, the card is free, and you would be crazy not to get it. It's if it, I've had, and I had customers like that where they, you know, they're coming from Abu Dhabi or whatever, and they're spending three hundred fifty dollars at my register. And I'm saying, well, I'm I'm going to sign you up for this thing and add it, even though you're never coming back, because it's going to take a chunk of money off your purchase. Uh, but those were the self-evident ones. Most of the customers were just, we need to play a numbers game here, and that can be tricky on its own, right? That, right? That, as you know, as if yourself. I often had this, this it was, I made it fun at my register, most of the uh, of my co-workers, especially at the end of my time with Barnes & Noble, I winced to hear it. I just winced. This was at the new store in the Prudential Center, where wincing was all I was really comfortable doing. At my old store, I I did not allow employees to, to, be, to brutalize the customers when they were near me. But the new store, unless it was egregious, I didn't, and the membership thing was required. The employees had to talk about it. Uh, I heard it done horribly, but even at my register, I would say, you know, do you shop here enough to make this worth your while? And the tricky part is that uh, that will get the customer to think about how often they come to the store. Most of the time, customers would say, oh, $25, there's no way I would earn that back. And I know that they're wrong because, like most of us, they're not really tracking how often they buy books. <laughs> and maybe if you made them do that, Instead of buying a membership card, they would make a New Year's resolution not to buy so many books. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was worthwhile to some customers. And this year, in 2023, Barnes & Noble has unveiled another level of loyalty program, Barnes & Noble Premium Membership, which instead of $25 costs $40. And you get a tote bag. And the tote bags are made you know, by the gross pallet load by slaves in China. They cost Barnes & Noble 50 cents per pallet. Uh, but they call it like a $20 value or something like that. They are cheaply made, and I believe they are V-folded bottoms. They don't have, I believe they don't have flat bottoms, which makes them, if they don't have flat bottoms, they're useless as tote bags, because, for books, anyway. You could maybe put papers in them. Uh, but for that $40 a year, you get you get the laminated card, uh, so that you can just flash it at the registers. You get 10% off everything in the store. You get 10% uh, uh, off almost everything online on the Barnes & Noble website. And you get free shipping with no minimum purchase. I think some of those things you also got with the original membership. It, it shifted around it as I was leaving the company. Uh, but you get, you get free shipping online. You get 10% off online purchases. You get 10% off most everything in the store. You get a free upgrade to the next size of whatever cafe drink you're getting. You get the tote bag. You get lots and lots. Members got lots and lots of coupons. That was the thing that I tended to stress, is that you would get email offers every day. And some of them were very good. Some of them were genuinely hefty. Uh, and I had my customers, I had regular customers of mine that really took advantage of that. 
they, they, it, there was almost there was almost always somebody in their reading circle for whom that latest coupon would apply. And those that added up. I often used to tell some of my I had regular customers at the Pru. And some of those regular customers we would we would swap stories about how if you added up how much you're saving with those things added in, then the twenty five dollars is rather self evident. Not always. Not most customers. Some of the other customers that I had, they just wanted to come in for a magazine and a coffee. That's all, and they don't want the hard sell. And they were the most irritated by the fact that the hard sell was required. Employees had to do it. They, it was just corporate money-making scheme intruding into what should have been a personal encounter every single time. I'm not 100% sure, looking back, how much that wasn't a factor in driving me away from the company. I always tell myself that the main thing that drove me away is that the, the thing that I was there for, the non-stop flow of customers that we had in the pre-internet days, went away. And I don't know if that was just bad luck on my part, I've certainly heard from and heard about other Barnes and Nobles where there is a steady traffic of customers all the time. Uh, Micah Cummins was just here for a visit. He said that the two Barnes and Nobles near him are busy when you go in. I don't know how much of that busy would translate to what I was there for, uh, mainly talking about books with customers, but uh, certainly the the requirement for the hard sell of this one thing at the register didn't help matters any. Uh, in addition to all of those coupons for the original Barnes Noble membership and for the premium membership, uh, you get birthday offers. You'll get a, a special coupon or a discount uh, offered on your birthday. And that's not conversational. The reason that Barnes Noble knows your birthday is because you can't have this membership without giving them an email. Uh, and you're going to get that email is going to get used. In addition to the, the promotions, you're also going to get every blast of every latest email. Barnes & Noble is putting out to the tune of sometimes five a day. <laughs> it, it could be a lot. I actually, when I wanted to test the original Barnes & Noble membership when it was rolled out, I wanted to test it and see what it was like. I wanted to know firsthand what I was talking to customers about. So I uh, gave Barnes & Noble an email, an old email of mine. And believe it or not, and some of you will probably believe it, I had to abandon that email because it was impossible to unsign up and it was flooded with Barnes & Noble spam several times a day so i had to just abandon it and for all i know it's still accumulating all that stuff <laughs> uh, but uh there are limitations especially connected with the the most signature thing the thing that i imagine barnes and noble employees right now are already even in june sick of explaining to customers which is the rewards program the new the new premium membership has a rewards program where for every ten dollars you spend you get a stamp and once you've got 10 stamps, 10 stamps is worth $5. So if you spend $100, you get a free $5 off of something. Lots of restrictions apply. It can't be everything. I'd be willing to bet it doesn't apply to electronics. I'm almost certain it doesn't apply to cafe stuff. I don't know. I haven't read the fine print. But one piece of fine print that I did read that jumped right out at me is that uh, the stamps expire at the end of every year. The card expires. You might think, if you're not familiar with this kind of loyalty program, certainly a lot of my customers weren't. I said $25. They said, oh, well, considering how long I'm going to be shopping here, that's pretty good. And I had to tell them, no, it's $25 a year. That is just greed. The corporate androids who used to come to the store periodically and try to justify this bunkum scheme would say the reason for that eye-watering annual charge for giving good customer service was that there are people at Barnes & Noble who, who administer the membership program, the cards aren't cheap to manufacture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's nonsense. That that's nonsense. It's less than a line item veto in in the in the one quarter of the company's budget. The card could be free. The membership could be free, uh, or it could cost five dollars or something like that, and forty dollars a year. <laughs> Ridiculous. When all you're getting back is that if you if you spend a hundred dollars. You can get five dollars off. You lose five dollars in your car in the time it would take you to get a, to spend a hundred dollars. It it it's so obvious. It's so that element of it is so obviously rapacious that it feels directly insulting. And I would I don't envy the Barnes and Noble employees who have to try to sell this thing uh, to customers because forty dollars is a large amount of money, and the the rewards kickback program 
is so miserly. <laughs> it's, it's just so obviously the opposite of generous. For people who are paying $40 for customer service they haven't got yet, they're paying $40 in order for the privilege of being a regular customer of yours when you should be paying them. For them to be paying that amount and get that tiny little grudging insult of a backhand slap back at the end of $100. <laughs> when I was listening to Jonathan's video, and uh, it really, the program that he was describing really wasn't appealing to me. He makes a self evident point. He makes a very good point in his video that if you buy a lot of new releases, he mentions, for instance, Brian Lee Durfee, another booktuber, great booktuber who does buy a lot of new releases. If you go to your Barnes & Noble and you buy a lot of new releases and you do that regularly, every paycheck, then even at the eye-watering price of $40, this premium membership is probably a really good idea. You'll be getting a discount of all those things. It's $5 a visit here, it's $6 a visit there. $60, you're getting 10% off that. And you're getting coupons kicked back to you. And some of those regularly, once a month, twice a month, will be take an extra 25% off something hefty discounts if you're buying that much new releases well first of all good on you <laughs> i wouldn't do that but i get them in the mail so i'm not a barnes noble customer anyway uh but i imagine brian lee turfey gets a lot of them in the mail as well if, if you are if you love the the thrill the pleasure i don't deny the pleasure at all it's really really real if you love the pleasure of going to your bookstore and buying new things uh, new mass market paperbacks, new trade, beautiful new trade paperbacks, new hardcovers from the tables. If you like that, and there's plenty to like about that, you probably go to your Barnes and Noble enough to justify forty dollars a year for a membership card, for a premium membership card. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Jonathan Cohen is right. He sounded a little bit ambivalent about whether or not he regularly spends enough money to to upgrade to the premium, but I bet he will. I bet he'll feel comfortable with it. It's like he says in his video, it's simply a question of doing the math. But doing the math requires being honest with how often you go to your Barnes & Noble and how much you spend when you do. Uh, but there's another element that came out in Jonathan's video. That's why I want all of you to troop over there like Brown's cows. Subscribe. Let's hoist him over 3,000 subscribers. And also watch his video because I want, I, as usual, I have a million nosy questions for you. Because... I want to know if you get the same impression that I did. It wasn't his, he is the sweetest guy in the world. It wasn't his impression. Uh, it wasn't his intention, I'm sure. But when I was watching his video, another reason against the premium membership kept coming up. And the simplest way I can put it is that although it wasn't his intention, in the course of his video, he was describing a poor bookstore. He mentions, you know, I... There are, it isn't always true that new releases will be out at my bookstore on the day of their release. Everyone, the internet exists. Everyone knows the day of a book's release. But it, I'll go to my Barnes & Noble, and often that new release won't be there. Or, you know, maybe some smaller releases won't be there. Maybe the store can get them for it. Maybe they can't. Barnes & Noble has hundreds of millions of dollars in operating budget. I was listening to his video. I was thinking, well, okay, but why wouldn't they have all the new releases out there? Isn't that their job? Isn't that what they are? He would mention, you know, I I can be tempted by the 10% off on the Barnes & Noble website, but I often have to wait when I order something, sometimes a long time. Whereas with Amazon, I don't have... He's being really nice about it, really, really thoughtful about it. All of his videos are thoughtful. But when I was watching, I was thinking, okay, but why would you use the bookstore that you're describing? <laughs> the bookstore that you... Why would you use it when in almost every metric that you're describing, except maybe the cafe... You're describing a poor bookstore. You're describing a bookstore for which there are better alternatives. <laughs> if that's true, if a number of you have come to that conclusion, I would like to hear about it. I want to mention just, I won't nag, I promise, but that gimmick about how the memberships, I think both of the memberships will get you a free upgrade to the next size of your caffeinated drink at Barnes & Noble. Um, you should be going in the opposite direction, okay? For those big plastic buckets full of sugared caffeine, you shouldn't be drinking, slurping any of that crap. You shouldn't be getting any of it. So the next biggest size, so if you're getting something that would feed a family of six in sub-Saharan Africa, you shouldn't be doing that at all. <laughs> but anyway, my nosy question is twofold. Partly it's connected with, with 
Jonathan's video, which is, do any of you actually have the Barnes & Noble Premium Membership? When you heard it rolled out, when you looked it up, when you looked into it, when you had it described to you at your store, as I'm sure you do, endlessly, uh, did you do the math, like Jonathan says, and come up with the idea that, yeah, this is a good deal, I should do this? I would love to hear if you did, and I'd love to hear why you did if you did. I'd also like to hear, if you have horror stories, feel free to unburden them, for instance, when you are at your Barnes and at, at my Barnes and Noble for a period under a particularly horrible manager, if you said to a customer, "Do you have our membership?" and the customer said, "No, I don't, and I'm not interested," that manager had a dictum for employees saying, "When the customer says, "No, I don't, and I'm not interested," you are supposed to ask again. Blatantly rude. You are supposed to browbeat the customer. Is that true at your Barnes and Noble? Are you allowed to say, "Just I don't want to hear the spiel. I just want to buy this." Are you allowed to do that? Or maybe are you worried that if you say that, the employee will be punished? Because maybe they have to say it? Uh, were you an, a customer at Barnes & Noble who bought either the original membership or the premium membership because of the spiel you got at the register? I w I've always wondered that myself. Do, do most people who buy into these things do it because they research it at home? without anyone breathing down their neck, without a line behind the people waiting for you to make a decision one way or another? Or did you make the decision because the, the employee told you about the program and you did the math in your head? Um, are you tempted by this new premium program? You have to sign up with an email. You can't sign up without one. You have to give them an email and to get birthday coupons, you have to give them your birthday. Your bookstore has absolutely no business knowing when your birthday is. No business at all. Maybe the finance and in New York, because your birthday is attached to your credit card, but not otherwise. And believe you me, they're making a lot more money selling that information about you than they are giving you a, you know, a, a flimsy tote bag or 10% off some tchotchke or something. Or other. I wonder how many of these things cross your mind. A lot of you, I know, are Barnes & Noble customers. Are a lot of you who are Barnes & Noble customers Barnes & Noble members? And if you were a Barnes & Noble member, did you upgrade to this new premium? Uh, Jonathan does, I think, a better do job describing a lot of it than I do, so go and watch his video and subscribe to get him over 3K. <laughs> but in addition to that, of course, what I want is the nosy questions. I want to ask a million nosy questions. Are you a member of Barnes & Noble on either of the tiers? Do you sometimes question whether or not it's worthwhile? Do you get coupons in the mail and do you use them? I would love to hear all of it. I would imagine, I mean, Jonathan alludes to this in his video, I would imagine that if you're the kind of Barnes & Noble customer who not only buys the occasional new release, or even not so occasional new release, but also uses their cafe, I would imagine that you would start to think long and hard about this. And I'm wondering how many of you do, and how many of you it makes financial sense. So tell me all about it. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i leave a link to Jonathan's video, and I'm going to wrap this up. It's just a, a question because it naturally touched on me. I had to sell these things. I had to sell membership cards. Uh, I, did, I, I don't know if I ever had an explicit quota, but I'm sure that quotas existed. I know for a fact that managers, when it came time for employee evaluations, were told by their upper-ups to concentrate almost exclusively on the membership sales. Just pretty much that. Uh, there was one manager that, who had made the mistake of being a human being who actually asked one of those upper-ups in corporate, what if they're a crappy employee? Do we want to keep them just because they're selling membership cards? I don't know what answer he got, but I know what the answer is. Because I was surrounded by crappy employees who were only there because they sold membership cards. And because they were crappy employees, they sold membership cards in crappy ways. By browbeating and bullying customers. I'd love to know if you experienced that at your Barnes & Noble. Maybe a couple of you are in the position that some of my customers were in. They would take me aside and say, look... I have really, really liked the book recommendations you have given me. I really like knowing that there's a book person here, but I'm not coming back to this Barnes & Noble, and it's because of the membership spiel. It's because I can't shut people up. I can't turn them off. I can't ask for help on the sales floor. I see an employee going by, and I just want to know where the travel books are. That's all I want to know, and the employee tells me where the travel books are, offers to take me to them. It's a sprawling store. I appreciate the offer. But it's not going to be small talk, small talk that they make on the way. They're going to be trying to sell me one of those damn cards. So I'm not going to come back here. I had, I had a few customers tell me I just wanted to say goodbye. 
I'm wondering maybe are you one of those customers? I'd love to hear it all. I'm just the whole subject of Barnes and Noble membership. So those of you who are watching from overseas, this won't this won't affect you at all. But those of you who have dealt with Barnes and Noble in your lives, I would love to hear your stories. So anyway, I'll wrap this up for now and I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.